Aloha mai kako. You are watching Hawaii Political Reporter. Aloha and welcome to Hawaii Political Reporter. Thanks for watching. Tonight, a potpourri that produces an educational, clear, and vivid picture of important events and actions that are off the mainstream radar that better our world and freedom. We begin with a short summary of current and developing stories, including what may really be behind the Benghazi cover-up, Syria, and the targeting of the U.S. ambassador by the U.S. government. We then join Adam Kokesh in an interview about his and the other marchers' very brave decision to stand up for their constitutional rights by marching armed into D.C., why are they doing it and what do they hope to accomplish? We then learn how energy development in Pennsylvania has changed residents' lives and ask would they do it again? This story is very relevant for Hawaii, especially as it relates to geothermal. Then back to the DC swamp where kids selling lemonade near the White House are harassed and molested by the police state. We finish with Aaron Hawkins explaining how the universe works in three minutes and how you can use this knowledge to better your choices and decisions. Hang on to your hats for this one. But first, we have a brief look at some local and state-related news. State Senator Russell Ruderman will be holding a community town hall meeting Thursday, May 30th, between 6 and 7.30 p.m. at the Kea Al Community Center. For more information, please call or go to russellruderman.com. If you live in Hawaii County, your health and happiness will be affected by the large-scale polluting energy development dropped on us by Honolulu. To find out what is really going on, I highly suggest you check out the Punapono Alliance and not most of the local media, which is paid off by those who profit from the geothermal development. Here. Media attention has turned towards the Benghazi scandal in the past several days and the build-up to today's hearings, in which three State Department whistleblowers were set to testify regarding the attack on the U.S. Embassy in Libya on September 11, 2012. The attack claimed the lives of four Americans. Some are claiming that the situation has the potential to take down the Obama administration. Others assert that this is unrealistic, but that it may damage Hillary Clinton's presidential ambitions in 2016. But politics aside, what's the real story here? Well, first of all, let's put this into perspective. Four Americans were killed. Yes, this is a tragedy for the families of these men, and if there is a cover-up, then they deserve to know the truth. However, let's not forget that this event came right after the U.S. and NATO toppled the Libyan government, a move which caused the death of up to 50,000 people by some estimates, and which seriously destabilized the country. The attention and the outrage surrounding these four American deaths compared to the total apathy for the suffering inflicted upon the Libyan people reflects a deep moral distortion, and this tunnel vision actually ensures that these kinds of tragedies will continue. The attack on Benghazi in particular would not have occurred at all if the U.S. had not invaded. Now, as for the cover-up, the crux of the public version of this scandal lies in the accusation that the ambassadors requested help during the attacks, and though there were troops in the area, they were instructed to stand down. There are also some who are focusing on the fact that Hillary Clinton and others in the Obama administration tried to pretend that the event was merely an escalation of the protest over the Innocence of Muslims video. This is where the mainstream media will draw your attention, and this is probably all that will come out in the hearings. Now, if assistance was intentionally denied, you shouldn't expect the U.S. government to come clean about it. They'll deny it to the very end. Because if this is the case, then what that indicates is that someone at the top levels of the State Department had reason to want Ambassador Stevens dead. What could that reason be? Well, retired General Jerry Boykin, former head of U.S. Special Forces Command and former Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence, has stated this likely had something to do with the fact that the U.S. was funneling weapons to Syrian rebels through Benghazi and that Stevens was most likely the one in charge of the operation. There's no question in my mind that we were funneling arms and uh, other types of material to the uh, to the Libyan rebels there. I think Stevens was uh, heading up that uh, covert action program and remember that a covert action program is you know by definition is one that uh, ultimately we would deny. Right. It, but it but it is also only executed after the president signs a finding and the Congress has been briefed on it. So I think Stevens was running guns is the bottom line. Right. Now, the, the question is, was this a legal covert action? Number one question. That's the first question. Which was it a legal covert action? The second question is, then what was Stevens doing there on the, you know, September 11th of 2012? Well, Our supposition was that he was now funneling guns to the rebel forces in Syria, using essentially the Turks to facilitate that. Now, did Stevens have a falling out with the administration? Was he about to blow the whistle on U.S. plans to topple Syria? Does this have something to do with the plans to frame the Syrian government for chemical weapons that were exposed in January? If Stevens was in fact in charge of material support to the rebels, as General Boykin asserts, then it follows that he would have known about this operation. Perhaps he didn't approve. 
Unless there's a real investigation, there's no way of knowing. And the fact that the media and government representatives are focusing on the surface issues here indicates that these hearings won't amount to much. This certainly isn't going to take down the Obama administration. That would only happen if the rule of law actually applied to government officials in the United States, and that's simply not the case. In other news stories this week, the online sales tax bill passed the Senate, but it supposedly faces a challenge in the House. Technically, if the government actually followed the rules, this bill would have already been thrown out for the simple reason that constitutionally, any law relating to taxation is to originate in the House, not in the Senate. This very objection is being used in a lawsuit against the Obama health care bill in a case now moving through the courts. However, historically, the government has never been forced to nullify a law on these grounds. Speaking of laws, a new law being drafted by the European Commission, which regulates all seeds and plants entering the Eurozone and imposes a yearly fee to maintain importation rights, has attracted protest. Critics say the law would cut off access to many rare strains such as heirloom vegetable varieties and would favor large agrochemical businesses. This move is part of a larger trend we're seeing worldwide to lock down and monopolize food production. In more humorous news, CNN, which has come under scrutiny several times this year by activists claiming that the company has intentionally falsified reports regarding Sandy Hook in the Boston bombing case, has now gotten caught red-handed faking what is supposed to be an interview conducted over satellite, but which is actually being filmed in the same parking lot. This slip-up was caught by the Atlantic Wire, who noticed that the same cars were passing by in the background while the reporters were talking. If you're going to fake your news reports, at least do it right. I mean, this is just sloppy. Commodity prices for those interested? Oil is at 96.30 a barrel, gold is at 14.73 an ounce, and silver is at 23.93 an ounce. If you like this format and you'd like us to do one video a week covering the news in this way, then please let us know in the comments and thumb up the video. If you'd like more content like this, please subscribe to this channel, Stormclouds Gathering, on YouTube. For updates and bonus content, follow us on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash stormcloudsgathering, on Twitter at Collapse Updates, and our website, stormcloudsgathering.com. It is the controversial gun rights rally the whole world may be watching. Possibly thousands of activists marching through the nation's capital with their guns slung across their backs. Organizer Adam Kokesh joins us now on set. We're going to speak with him in just a moment or two. But first, a little background for you. According to the event's Facebook page, participants will march with loaded rifles across the Memorial Bridge, down Independence Avenue, around the Capitol, the Supreme Court, and the White House, and then peacefully returned to Virginia across the Memorial Bridge, same way they came in. And our Facebook is bursting with comments, most of them against the planned march. Mark Marco Marco says, being allowed to walk around in public with a loaded weapon for any other purpose than that of law enforcement just seems like an open door for trouble. And Lisa Joe Worth says, sounds like a bunch of brainless bullies that have no respect for laws that elected officials created. A.J. McDonald Jr. says, Kokesh is a provocateur and has been for a long time advocating armed rebellion, which he has as a federal offense, yet he gets away with it because he's a provocateur. Well, he, Mr. Kokesh, is here with us right now. Thank you for coming in, sir. My pleasure. Good Thanks to for have covering you. this. All right, first of all, what do you want to accomplish here? What's this all about? Thomas Jefferson said, when the people fear the government, there is tyranny. When the government fears the people, there is liberty. Clearly, we've come to a state in America where people fear the government a lot more than the other way around. We aim to change that equation. We also want to inspire people to do something meaningful with Independence Day, rather than sit on their butts, get fat watching fireworks, and patting <laughs> themselves on the back for what a great country this is, when it's more like that it used to be. But we'd also want to inspire people to assert their self-ownership, and that they are free, beautiful, independent human beings, and that there are certain inalienable rights that go along with that. All right, let, let, me, let me ask you this. Why do you say that people fear the government? Where, where, where are you getting that? Well, you can look at it just from the reaction to this event, and it's really sad, and, and as you saw from the, the comments that you shared, People are saying that we're going to break laws. We're going to break regulations, maybe some written codes in, in D.C., but we're actually going to follow the law. We are going to stop criminals. And I'm talking about D.C. Chief of Police Kathy Lanier, who said that she's going to arrest us. And I understand that that's to be expected, but it's a violation of the Second Amendment to the Constitution that she swore an oath to when she took that position. Is it your argument that any restriction on gun laws at all is a violation of the Second Amendment, therefore you should not be subject to arrest even if you break the laws in D.C.? Well, I wish that any regulations or restrictions on an individual's right to defend themselves were uh, accomplished peacefully through the market, through people interacting nonviolently, not through government. But when you talk about the government regulation, there may be appropriate restrictions, but clearly the individual right in public to be armed is certainly being infringed upon, and, and it would be in line with the Second Amendment to assert that right. All right, let me read MPD's response to what you're saying. They say, we know this is being discussed as an issue of civil disobedience, but it is a crime under both district and federal law to cross state lines carrying a loaded gun. So, MPD and other law enforcement agencies in the district will respond as needed. If they want to transport the guns through the district in compliance with the U.S. and district laws, that's allowable. 
Well, these criminals have made it clear that they don't understand the law, they don't understand the Constitution, and they don't even understand the definition of civil disobedience. Like, what we are doing is going to deliberately break what we consider to be an unjust so in law words, in accordance prepared, with prepared, the highest law of the land. You will accept the arrest, then. You, if you're going into civil disobedience, part of that is you accept the consequences of your actions and Absolutely. if it's arrest. How many people have signed up for this? About 3,000 right now, and I'm willing to face five years in jail and up to $5,000 fine for the, the crime that I would be committing there, which is really a non-crime, no victim, no crime. But we're asking now, in response to the chief's uh, address of, of this, that we are calling for mass civil disobedience throughout the District of Columbia on Independence Day. There are tons of unjust laws, whether you believe in freedom of speech, freedom of expression, the freedom to defend yourself. There are lots of regulations that are passed and enforced every day in D.C. that are clear violations of your rights as an individual. Your take is the government's gotten too big, too many laws, too many restrictions, and we're not as free as we should be. And that's the point you're trying to make? Well, it's fundamentally immoral to, by force, impose your will on another human being, whether you have a fancy written law to justify it, a, a shiny badge, or, or a government gun. It doesn't justify imposing your will on someone else by force. We want to fight back against that. We want to mark the high tide. The, the, the high watermark of government, we mm. want to turn the tide by inspiring people to assert their self-ownership. And we are going to stop the criminals in D.C. We are not the criminals. We are the law-abiding, peaceful people who want to stand up for what is righteous and just. They are the ones who have made it clear. Not only do they not understand the law, they have no respect for it whatsoever. Right, let, let, you let want me, to talk me, about the Obama let, let, administration. Let me, let me, we can talk about that for a minute, but, but in, I want to say that you're calling the duly elected representatives of the people criminals. Is that yes. fair? Absolutely. Why? Because they break the law. Okay, but they make the law because they've been elected by the people to do that, right? Right. Well, apparently there were laws that were passed before the ones that any elected officers in office today ever wrote, and it's called the Constitution, it's supposed to be the supreme law of the land. I don't think that really gives credibility to government when it can't follow its own silly little rules, but really it, it's made it clear that, that it has no moral justification for what it's doing. All right, you've got 3,000 people you say are planning to come to this march. We'll, well see how many to be, show Hold up. on, to be fair, we've only had the page up for just four days now. Just a few days it's been up, and we've already seen an incredibly positive and enthusiastic response. We've said that when we get to 10,000, we're going to commit to specific plans. If we do that by June 1st, we look very are well on track to Are you prepared to that. work with, with uh, Metro District Police to make sure this stays peaceful? and to deal with the effect of an arrest if it happens. Absolutely. No, we intend to fully coordinate with all law enforcement agencies in advance. And, and I hesitate to use the word, but it, it might be to the point of being choreographed. It, it's going to be that safe. But to be, to be, to be honest, I, I feel much safer knowing that I'm going to be surrounded by armed Americans who care about their rights than I would be on a, on, a, on a in a dark alley in any city where guns are illegal. All right, fair enough, Mr. Kokesh. Interesting. It's going to be a fascinating summer. We I will hope, watch yeah. you. I hope people go to AdamVersusTheMan.com to find out more and and please to RSVP on the Facebook page as well. All right, thanks for joining us. This is your last morning. That would have been the end of it, and that would have been justice for Kelly Thomas, who might be alive today. Back up. Welcome to From the Front Lines. This is Jay Wilcox, and we're in Bradford County, Pennsylvania, with dairy farmer Carol French. The landman came to Carol's area and sold hydraulic fracturing as a once-in-a-lifetime lottery for the farmers. Farms, especially small family farms, are struggling. The landman and the gas industry, they know this very well. The Frenches and their neighbors, they signed the contracts. They had no idea what was in store for them. In fact, the landman never mentioned hydrofracking at all. He didn't talk about truck traffic, 24-hour noise, water pollution, air pollution, things that are associated with the natural gas industry and hydraulic fracturing. He didn't talk about least length water usage or radioactivity. So the farmers, they assumed these leases were similar to traditional gas leases they had signed in the past. These new leases, they were loaded with fine print. From the front lines, we'd like to welcome dairy farmer, Carol French. We um, were excited uh, that they were offering $25 an acre. We thought that was great. Uh, we thought maybe we should uh, shut the door before the fool changed his mind. But then we had neighbors calling saying, hey, look, the landman is offering us $35 an acre. So then uh, we probably about six to eight months of negotiating 
we ended up getting some pretty good addendums at the time and we ended up signing for $85 an acre and we were really thrilled. This was in August 29th of 2006. Two years later, uh, they drilled on my neighbor about 500 feet away from us. It was a vertical well and it was an emotional roller coaster for a lot of us. It's like, oh no, they won the lottery. They got the well on their property. Within about three weeks, we realized that we were taken advantage of, that everything that was promised and we thought was in the lease was all a lie. Um, this We have a thing down Pennsylvania, it's called the Clean and Green Act, where you pay, it's a differential on your farmer's taxes so you can continue agricultural use, and I think New York has a different name for it, but anyway, you have a seven-year penalty, and it's on the parcel. The gas company said that they would pay those penalties when the county wanted to collect the penalties, the gas company says only on the affected area. You look at it in your lease, and it will tell you that we will pay on the affected area. So they only had to pay $3,000, and the farmer had to pay $20,000. And in reality, they had to pay the $20,000. They never received royalties because it was only a test well. It was so new, everything was becoming a lie. It was a light bulb moment for us. It's like, all right, we better understand what is going on. So Carolyn Knapp and I went to uh, Susquehanna County. We watched Dimmick, and we really didn't know what was going on. There was a lot of fuss going on there. Um, we saw some water, we saw some contamination, and it's like, it was iffy. We really didn't know if that was true or not. You know it's real when it happens to you, though. Um, March 15th, 2011, our water turned. Uh, they started drilling December, the end of December 2010. January 2011, we had three wells surrounding our home. By July, we had five more. The final one was in October of 2011, and that's when our water stayed white for a whole week. Two weeks later, our daughter got sick, and I'll show you what my water looks like. This is um, July this year's water, and this is what it looks like. It turns out white. Um, when it comes out of the faucet, it's a very pearly white. It'll settle with the sand at the bottom, and then I'll have a green moss on top and it'll gel like jello, but this has been around since July, and so the gel is out of it. Um, the gas companies were a little concerned about our gelled water. They wanted to know how far the gel was in the water, and um, I told them they could stick their finger in it because I wasn't going to. But it's real, and I don't think anybody can relate to that until it happens to them. Uh, just now my neighbor, she, uh, her water changed Monday, and it's December the 3rd, and she brought down her water, and this is what her water looks like today. Um, she, she just has a brand new washing machine, and her water is that black particle stuff, and if you smell it, it smells like sewer. And it was okay that my water changed. But as soon as it happened to her, it's almost like all hell broke loose. Now what do I do? We're, we're in panic mode. I can tell you that I have contacted DEP, and that was a year ago. And to this date, they have not come and test my water. I can tell you that the DEC will do the same. Um, they are both in the pocket of the gas company. They, the gas company directs them in how to test their water. and what chemicals they're going to show. So, I don't know. Um, is it worth it? Um, we got $13,600. And this is what we lost. A farm, Claude is 60 years old. So the farm was our home. It's where we raise our children. It was our retirement. It was our business. And now we could face losing our milk market, losing the value of our cows, 
in Pennsylvania, in Bradford County, I know people that have lost 80 to 90 percent of their property value. So, for example, a, a home on Paradise Road, Terry Township, was worth $395,000. It was appraised at $39,000 because they lost their water. You also face the fact that you can't sell the property. We, we don't have the water. Nobody's providing this water. Our cows have had rashes coinciding with the rashes I have on my body. Well, my rashes have subsided um, of late. My daughter, last year, right after the two weeks of white water, got sick. She ended up having a high fever. She ended up having um, diarrhea. She lost 10 pounds in seven, in seven days. And she was curled up in a ball. And if anybody's out there watching and says, so what if my water changes, I'll make enough money on royalties that I can buy my water, I can buy another place to go. You look at your child and she's laying in the, in the bed, curled up, begging for help. She had awful pains in her stomach, so we took her to the hospital. They did um, urine testing and blood work. They found high white cell count in her urine, or in her um, urine, but not in her blood. So that prompted them to do an MRI. They found high, uh, what's called free floating fluid in her lower abdomen. And then they found that her right ovary, her spleen and her liver were very enlarged. They treated her for um, urinary tract infection, but there was not a urinary tract infection at all. Uh, they called four days later and said, we don't know what's wrong with her. Um, my neighbor, north of here, went through the same symptoms in April, six months prior, I think it's six months prior, but her spleen burst in three days after she went to the hospital. My daughter knew she couldn't stay here. We knew she couldn't stay here. So she left. Is the $13,000 worth it? Is $2 million worth it? How do you put a price on your child's life? How do you put a price on your business? How do you put a price on your food source? What, what's it worth? Thanks, Carol. That is the question. What is it worth? Are we really going to contaminate the planet's water, our aquifer for 10 to 15 years of natural gas? You decide. This is Jay Wilcox, and you've been watching From the Front Lines. We're going to liberate some lemons today. Lemonade, 10 cents. Only 10 cents, guys. 10 guys. cents, lemonade. 10 cents, lemonade. It's really hot out. 10 cents a cup. Lemonade, 10 cents. Here they go. Permit, right? No, sir. Can't be here. Air to the freedom! Woo! Here you are, dearie. Hope you have a lovely afternoon. Thank you. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks a lot. There's no vending on Capitol grounds. You guys are that. Free country, ma'am. You guys are continuing. Do you want lemonade? Yeah. Did you want a cup? Ten cents for some lemonade, guys. Two more? Yeah. Perfect. Thank you so much for your business. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Would you like a cup as well? Not for sale. Not for sale. Yeah, don't be intimidated. Don't be intimidated. Don't let the, Don't be intimidated by them. Whoa, whoa! Hey, hey, hey! Private property, don't You got that on camera. Please don't break equipment, man. Voluntary. No money. Thank you. 
They want to, they want to give you something for free. They'll give it to you for free. They're not giving them any money. Ten cents. Ten cents. Ten cents. Ten cents. Ten cents. Don't give them any money. We are free people. This is Bendy without a permit to get out of my face. Bendy without a permit. So you guys want to be arrested for your cause of lemonade liberation. Ma'am. Come liberate the lemons. Lemonade, 10 cents, guys. 10 cents lemonade. 10 cents lemonade. Come get your 10 cents lemonade while it's nice and cold. Do not use violence. Do not use violence and force against peaceful people. Ma'am, leave these people alone. Leave these people alone. I'm sorry, you're under arrest. Leave these people alone. Leave, 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 them, alone. People alone. leave them alone. I am getting arrested for selling my. Do you guys have services? Lemonade, 10 cents, guys. We've got a few cups left. That's what I have. Come you sell lemonade. Why are you kidding me? I'm selling lemonade. Is there anything on you that can destroyed. This concept was established by Einstein's equation E equals mc squared and has been confirmed by numerous experiments. Therefore, energy has always existed and will always exist. This means that our current concept of time where everything has a beginning and an end is false. If we follow this line of reasoning, it should be obvious that any scientific theory that describes the origins of the universe is not actually describing the origin of energy, but rather of one particular expression of that energy. Science traces the origins of the universe to a timeless and motionless state called the singularity. Since the singularity is timeless, it cannot be talked about as before or after anything. If something exists but is not before or after anything, then it is now. Therefore, the singularity is now. Again, energy can neither be created nor destroyed. Therefore, all of the energy in existence is present in a singularity. Time and space are one fabric. You cannot have one without the other. This is a basic premise of modern physics. There is no time in the singularity, therefore there is no space in the singularity. Without space and time, there can be no separation or individuation. Therefore, energy cannot be separated from the singularity. It is one entity, a unified monolithic field with no boundaries, and it cannot be broken up or divided in any way. This is the eternal and omnipresent root of the universe. This is the essence of what we are. And yet the relative universe exists. Separation and individuation exist. How do we reconcile this? How can two people sit down and have a conversation if they are both expressions of the same indivisible field of energy? A good way to conceptualize this is to use the metaphor of a video game on your computer. The characters in the game are all running on the same hardware. Their spatial separation is illusory, and their time-based interactions are expressions of pre-existing possibilities within this framework. It is the encoding of time that creates the possibility of interaction both in a video game and in the real world. In the video game, that code of time is stored with all the probabilities and possible outcomes coexisting on a disk. In the real world, the code of time with all the probabilities and possible outcomes resides in the singularity. This does not imply that our lives are predetermined and free choice is impossible. All probabilities, all possible outcomes coexist in one moment. But in each moment, we choose from those probabilities and our lives are expressions of those choices. These choices aren't always rational or constructive, but this is due largely to a distorted view of who we are. If rather than viewing ourselves as strictly isolated individuals at odds with the outside world, we viewed ourselves as part of a single unified field of existence, how might that change the way we interact? How would we treat others if we understood that everything we do to them, we are actually doing to ourselves? Think about it. If you'd like more content like this, please subscribe to this channel, Storm Clouds Gathering, on YouTube. For updates and bonus content, follow us on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash Storm Clouds Gathering. 
on Twitter at Collapse Updates, and our website, StormCloudsGathering.com. The Federal Reserve is no more federal than Federal Express. Ba, 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 ba. Future a high dam, this show a freedom, ma. You seek agenda, we know you know you anti-American. You come poverty, American constitution. 1913, corrupt in the system. DW dollar, hyperinflation. The Federal Reserve, controlled by Lucifer. <laughs> See you lying